the session now. Um, secondly, the speakers will be talking for about 15 minutes and then there'll be time for questions afterwards. Um, if you have a question during the um, presentation, can you put it in the chat and we will then refer to that during the question session. And then during the session, we would ask that you'll, you raise your hand and, and we'll ask you to, to ask your question. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Abe to start with, and he'll be covering AF. Thank you. Thank you, Salian. And uh, let me just start sharing my screen first. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. So. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. And my name is uh, Dr. Abhay Bajpayee. I'm a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist. I work, uh, I'm based at two trusts, uh, predominantly at Epsom St. Helier uh, Hospital. And um, I have uh, two full days of uh, work at St. George's Hospital as well, where I carry out my procedural work. So. I've been handed the responsibility to take you through the uh, newly designed atrial fibrillation primary care pathway. Many of you may already be familiar with it. Uh, it is in circulation and um, uh, we should be using it uh, 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 um, as soon as possible. So <clears throat> before I go through the pathway itself, um, I'd like to stress a little bit on the definitions of atrial fibrillation. It is crucially important to define uh, what type of atrial fibrillation we are dealing with um, because the treatment and the outcome depends on it. When you see a patient um, with atrial fibrillation, uh, this could be an episodic type of atrial fibrillation. We term it as paroxysmal and it's defined as anything between 30 seconds to up to seven days, which, yeah. which is paroxysmal. Uh, anything beyond seven days is termed persistent. Um, anything beyond one year of that persistent is now termed long-standing persistent. Now, permanent atrial fibrillation does not necessarily mean chronicity of fibrillation. Uh, you could have a person in paroxysmal AF or very recently diagnosed persistent AF. And if there has been acceptance between the patient, they are relatively asymptomatic to do nothing, just accept fibrillation as it is, i.e. we are not aiming for um, any rhythm control strategies. Um, it is then termed as permanent. So permanent is what is accepted. Um, let me take you through the pathway now. So you can come across uh, a patient with atrial, with atrial fibrillation through three different, essentially three different modes. It could be an incidental finding. Um, you've performed an ECG or a Holter uh, for some other reason, um, or patient has presented elsewhere for any other condition and incidentally found to be in atrial fibrillation. Um, this may be uh, an opportunistic finding, uh, i.e. you are actively involved uh, during various um, clinics, for example, flu clinics, or to actively check the pulse and have picked up atrial fibrillation. Um, or patient may present with symptoms, um, which are, which, uh, and you find your regular pulse and you suspect atrial fibrillation. Common symptoms, people Abbe, present Abbe, with it. Yeah. Abbe, can I just interrupt, interrupt you? You're, you haven't moved on any of your slides, by the way. Sorry, what are you seeing on the screen right now? We're still seeing your name. Really? Because my screen is different. Uh, so I have my first slide you didn't see of classification of AF. I, mean, I don't know if anybody else can see a different screen. No, mine's the same. It just says Dr. Abbe. That is odd. Um, I have moved through two slides already. Yeah, could you run it from your side? Because that's odd. Um, um, let me try just sharing desktop, have a and see if that works instead. Yeah, 
you want me to see if I can share my screen? Yeah, if you could share, um, I'll stop sharing from here. Sorry about that. Um, from my end, I was moving smoothly. Uh, my slides, I've stopped sharing. If you could bring up my slides, please. So can you now see it's saying classification of AF? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I see it blank. Yeah, now I can see it. OK, and can we increase the size of the screen? It's uh, quite small. Is that better? Uh, try going on to the, the, the slideshow. It, it, is, it is on the slideshow. It's the same, Sally Ann. Oh. So, I, so I'm seeing it on slideshow. That's fine. Maybe just come out of that and then we can just zoom in slightly. On, there we go, yeah. How's that? that that's probably better. So I'll just quickly run through this again. So when you see patients with atrial fibrillation, um, you can categorize them into paroxysmal if uh, fibrillation is uh, between 30 seconds to seven days, uh, persistent if it's more than seven days, uh, long-standing if it is beyond one year. And at any point, if there is acceptance between um, yourselves and the patient that you're not going to do anything for fibrillation, uh, i.e. no rhythm control strategies, then it is automatically uh, classified as permanent atrial fibrillation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So when you suspect atrial fibrillation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you may see or suspect atrial fibrillation through three different ways. One is the incidental finding uh, when someone else has done or you've done an ECG and you pick up atrial fibrillation, patient does not have any symptoms. Uh, it may be through opportunistic um, um, uh, 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 clinics uh, like flu clinics or you have you're running a blood pressure clinic and you've checked the pulse and you found atrial fibrillation or a patient may present with uh, symptoms of atrial fibrillation now the common symptoms um, are fatigue breathlessness palpitations sometimes dizziness particularly if heart rate is fast atrial fibrillation tends not to present with syncope unless um, person is already with a relatively low blood pressure and have suddenly changed into a very rapidly conductive fibrillation. Um, but the common symptoms are fatigue, breathlessness, uh, palpitations. Um, actually, I can't point out on this because I'm not sharing the screen. Uh, but if we go down from uh, the first uh, where it says uh, box two, when a person presents with symptoms, uh, it is important to recognize if they are. Uh, no, I think the previous slide, uh, previous slide again. So could you go back to the? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So it's important to recognize um, how stable and unstable these symptoms are. So if a person has very high heart rate beyond 120, 130 beats per minute, or uh, they are presenting with chest pain, severe breathlessness, features of heart failure, blackouts, then they need to be referred um, urgently to either the A&E or if there is an urgent referral pathway um, in, in your local area. Um, if they are relatively asymptomatic or have minimal symptoms, um, you must arrange an ECG, preferably within the next two days. Um, and organize some blood tests. Now, the relevant blood tests uh, in context of atrial fibrillation, um, of course, you'd be doing full blood count, liver, metabolites, etc. cetera. Um, it's important to rule out thyroid disorder. It's important to rule out any concurrent infection because these are common causes of, of uh, acute atrial fibrillation. If 
um, now if the person has episodic atrial fibrillation, um, could somebody point out to where it says C box four? Um, we are at that stage of the algorithm because I can't use my cursor. I'm really sorry. Um, so if if you could, yeah, that's it. So if uh, uh, you suspect paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, question then arises: What sort of ambulatory ECG um, you want to organize? And a simple simple guide is if people have highly frequent symptoms, then you can just do away with the 24 hour Holter recording. Um, but it's essentially the frequency of symptoms that um, one needs to use as a guide, um, whether a 24 hour recorder is useful or you need a seven day recorder or even longer event recorders. So think about the frequency of symptoms because many times we keep organizing 24 hour holters and nothing is picked up um, and we dismiss atrial fibrillation. Um, um, in other circumstances where there is a dilemma, we can, you know, patient can be referred to us and we can uh, consider a loop recorder implant if diagnosis is still under suspicion. Once uh, you have diagnosed atrial fibrillation, then we move where to the section where it says C box five, um, then the fun begins. Uh, how to manage atrial fibrillation? Now, it is extremely crucial that once AF is diagnosed, uh, the first priority is stroke prevention, and that is every person's responsibility. Uh, sorry, keep, could you stay on the previous slide? So that is every person's responsibility. So at the point of diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, we must uh, assess their stroke risk and initiate the stroke prevention pathway. Ideally, a person, if there are no contraindications, should be prescribed uh, oral anticoagulation uh, then and there. Um, otherwise, you can refer uh, to your local pathways, local anticoagulation clinic, etc. You must assess uh, what is their symptom burden. Um, do they require rate control? There is now increasing stress um, to uh, to provide what is called upstream therapies, um, and this is what is now termed as an integrated approach um, uh, to manage atrial fibrillation. Uh, we it is it crucially important to tackle obesity, tackle obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, uh, tackle uh, any untreated hypertension, untreated diabetes, because these are the very factors, sleep apnea syndrome, these are the very factors um, that will promote development and persistence of atrial fibrillation. And it becomes extremely hard uh, to uh, achieve effective rhythm control if these background factors are not uh, controlled. Uh, so it is extremely important to educate patients um, um, and manage these risk factors if we have to overcome uh, atrial fibrillation in long term. Pathway to this stage should not take any more than two weeks because again here the priority is stroke prevention. Um, you then uh, see the patient if, uh, could you just enlarge the screen again please because I'm unable to see it properly. Uh, or I'll bring it up on my end. Is that, is that big enough for you? Yeah, that, that's big enough. Um, OK, so at this point you need to consider whether a person requires a secondary referral and in my last slide I will go through the points which I have to find in a very simplistic manner uh, which you can use. They're also uh, there in the guide within this algorithm. Uh, so I'll go through the referral uh, criteria um, at the end. Uh, so Abe, you have two minutes left I'm afraid. Okay yeah I'm almost almost finishing. Uh, think about rate control. Uh, so if they are in persistent atrial fibrillation and the heart rate is beyond 110, uh, you must offer rate control. Uh, there is always a question 
what sort of uh, heart rate one must achieve. There is now clear agreement that if they are relatively asymptomatic, they don't have heart failure, a heart rate of 110 or below is acceptable. If they are symptomatic, we need to achieve a heart rate below 90. And I won't go through the details of the rate controlling medication. They are common ones are by soprolol, uh, or if the patient is very sedentary, you can use digoxin. Um, if they are relatively asymptomatic with rate control, they only require annual review. But if the symptoms persist, then uh, you should refer to the local arrhythmia services. So if I could go back, go to my last slide. When a patient should be referred. So I think we are seeing you're not seeing the top portion of the slide. Yeah, that's it. So essentially, so you know, to make things easy, essentially, who is the person who does not require referral? Essentially, this is a person who is relatively asymptomatic and is not in heart failure, does not need to be referred. All other categories of patients will require referral. So people who have poor rate control despite medication or they are developing bradycardia, i.e. what is termed as tachybrady syndrome, they require referral. If they are if they are having paroxysmal, symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, these tend to be very young patients and they often benefit from ablation therapy. Um, if they are having symptomatic persistent atrial fibrillation despite being adequately rate control, uh, they will then benefit from cardioversion, antiarrhythmic drug use, or ablation therapy. Patients who have atrial fibrillation with heart failure or other forms of structural heart disease um, or congenital heart disease will require referral. If they are intolerant or there is any contraindication to anticoagulation, um, they will then require uh, referral. Uh, we may then need to consider what is, um, uh, other forms of uh, stroke prevention, such as left atrial appendage occlusion. And there is a last point which uh, we can't see on the screen, but this is uh, if uh, you feel the patient is will still benefit from rate control, uh, sorry, rhythm control, um, and the patient feels he needs to, you know, see us. We will be happy to see uh, and discuss further options. Sorry, that was a quick one because of initial hiccups. Um, I'm happy to take questions. So there's a question in the chat from Vishal. Um, it says, how long would you continue anticoagulation uh, for in AF post cardiac surgery? For example, elective cabbage that has reverted to SR and confirmed on 48 hour tape. Yeah, that's a good question, actually, um, because AF in this category, in this group, is very common. And I would not hesitate to continue it even long term. Uh, we have to be absolutely sure that the person is not having even asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, which they cannot recognize. So we, unless we have a means to, to really uh, exclude atrial fibrillation, uh, there is no... Uh, you know, it, it is simply a clinical judgment. Um, and of course, at that point, you know, we are happy to discuss um, in secondary care. We may then have to look at, you know, other parameters. What is the left atrial size? May need to do, you know, few ambulatory recordings and then confirm definitely this was a, se a secondary cause related AF uh, uh, rather than recurring AF. I hope that answers. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Any other questions? Abe, thank you very much. I, I think you've got um, to get into, into, into the cath labs now, so we'll, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for that. Really, really useful overview. Um, and we will we, we can speak we can circulate the pathway as well um, with the with the with the um, the email that goes out with certificates and the recording. Yeah, and uh, the second page of pathway, which I didn't go through because you know it's a very useful guide, um, which um, which 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 is addressed as box one, box two. It's an extremely useful guide and a very useful pathway. So please go through it. Thank you very much. Um, can I hand over to you, Simon, please?
Uh, yes, thank you very much, Nell. And let me see if I can get uh, the technology to work. Uh, there we are. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Lovely, fantastic. Let's hope. Um, I moved. Is that gone to slide two, Sanyan? Still on slide okay, so one. Let um, me just come out of it and go back in again. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll share my desktop instead of sharing. Yeah, the good idea. again. Uh, that I've gone on to my second slide. Perfect, yeah, got it. Perfect. Technology works. Uh, so thank you very much. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Simon Pierce. I'm a cardiology consultant at Kingston and St George's Hospital. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is something that's been in the news a fair bit recently and certainly has come to dominate our, our professional lives and probably our general lives as well. And that is that that is the, the dreaded COVID-19. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today specifically is is the emerging evidence for the interaction between COVID-19 and, and heart disease and look at that in a bit more detail. What I'm going to run through is acute COVID and how that can interact with, with heart disease and cause heart disease. I'm going to talk a bit about long COVID, something that I'm sure will be very much on your radars already. What we can do about it and what little evidence there is, but what, what might work for these patients. And I'm going to talk a bit about the, the medicines we use for COVID and the heart and how they might, uh, how they might interact. As I'm sure you are very well aware, COVID-19 is a virus that binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is found in the lungs predominantly, causes an inflammatory uh, lung condition, but also is found in the heart and elsewhere in the body. So there's lots of interaction between uh, COVID and the heart. And one of the sort of themes that came out very early on in the COVID pandemic is just how common uh, cardiac comorbidity is in patients who get really ill with COVID-19. Um, so uh, you can see the studies uh, chronologically there, and you can see it started in China, went to Italy, and then went to America. Um, and the thing that I wanted to highlight from this slide really is that amongst those this patients uh, hospitalized or being admitted to hospital and being admitted to ITU with COVID, um, and that is that cardiovascular disease is present in somewhere between about 5 and 15% of people being admitted to hospital. But if you look at those being admitted to ITU, up to about a quarter of those patients have cardiovascular disease. Um, similarly, with hypertension, in some of these case series, more than half of the patients being admitted to ITU had hypertension um, and about a quarter of patients with diabetes. So it does seem from this registry data that not only um, are you perhaps more likely to get COVID, perhaps more likely to get severe COVID if you've got coexistent cardiovascular disease, uh, but your outcomes are going to be worse as well. You're more likely to need intensive uh, care therapy as part of your illness. So if we think about COVID-19, so not only does pre-existing cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, predisposed to catching COVID in the first place, but actually COVID itself can cause problems with your heart. And one of the things it can do is cause myocardial injury, or in some, pa some patients, the myocarditis or myopericarditis. Uh, and if you look at troponin levels in patients hospitalized with COVID-19, depending on which series you look at, up to about 20% of them actually have a positive troponin, suggesting some myocardial cell death some cardiac involvement in, uh, in the, in the COVID-19 infection. And if you follow those patients through, they have much higher mortality, more than double the mortality in most case series compared to patients that don't have an elevated troponin with, uh, with COVID-19. So the question is, why is that? Now, some of it, or in some patients, there's no doubt that it's due to the systemic, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, the cytokine storm you get in very severe COVID-19, where you release all these interleukins and tumor necrosis factors and all these other things um, that cause inflammation in the heart, cause cell death, cause troponin release. But in some patients, we've definitely found uh, COVID-19 RNA in their hearts on myocardial biopsy or in post-mortem studies. So it does seem that in some patients, COVID-19 actually binds to the heart, goes to the heart, and causes direct cell death, causing a myocarditis, which of course can lead to heart failure um, and potentially life-threatening. This is a study from China uh, looking at survivors and non-survivors. So survivors are the, the blue line at the bottom and, and uh, red, the red line is the, the people who died, sadly, and high sensitivity uh, troponin at the, at the y-axis. And what you can see very clearly is the patients who died are the ones that had the high troponins. So whether that's because of more aggressive infection in the heart or whether that's because of, whether that's a marker of a more severe systemic inflammatory illness, uh, or a bit of both, I suspect it's probably a bit of both, but it's a very bad sign having a hydroponium with uh... Now, acute coronary syndromes. Now, intellectually, you'd probably think that having COVID would increase your risk of myocardial infarction. We know that COVID causes blood clots, which causes myocardial infarction. We know that you get activated macrophages with viral infections like COVID, and we know that these affect the vascular endothelium. These can break up um, atherosclerotic plaques and cause the blood clots and cause heart attacks. Um, and the data on this is pretty thin, actually, but in a, in a 
Jesus from uh, from Italy last year. They looked at 28 patients presenting as, as primary PCIs with COVID um, for ST elevation MI uh, and new left bundle branch block. And actually only 60% of them required revascularization, which suggests that quite a few of these patients actually didn't have an acute clot in their coronary arteries or didn't have an acute plaque in their coronary arteries, but actually maybe were suffering with acute myocarditis rather than, uh, rather than coronary disease. But what's quite scary about this data is Look at the mortality at 13 days. Almost 40% of these patients were dead at 13 days. Um, so staggeringly high mortality in those presenting with, uh, with EC, big ECG changes and, uh, and COVID. But almost a universally experienced phenomenon during, particularly during the first lockdown around a year ago, um, is this. And actually, this is the, the massive reduction in patients presenting to hospital with myocardial infarction during the pandemic. Uh, and the, this data is reproduced in everywhere in Europe and in the US as well. So if you take all the myocardial infarctions, there was almost a 50% drop uh, compared to the year before 2019 uh, during the first lockdown, particularly driven by a big drop in, in non-ST elevation MI, but also a quarter less ST elevation MIs. And it'd be nice to think this is because people weren't having as many heart attacks, but I suspect that's optimistic. I suspect there's a lot of people sitting at home having their heart attacks and not coming to hospital for fear of being exposed to COVID. And I suspect we'll see the back end of this with the heart failure and arrhythmia further down the line. So talking about arrhythmia, so lots of possible causes for, for arrhythmia uh, in, co in acute COVID infection. So a systemic illness involving inflammation increases your risk of uh, arrhythmia, and we've seen this in previous pandemics. Uh, myocarditis, if there's inflammation of the heart, then increases your risk of both bradyarrhythmia and VT and VF. Patients might get ischemic in the context of acute MI or in the context of sepsis and increased metabolic demand, and there might be some drug-drug interactions as well that might increase the risk. And Again, data is based on case series, so that's basically what we've got with most COVID stuff. Uh, there's a study done of 700 patients, 11 hospitalized patients, 11% of which were in ITU. Uh, and amongst those 700, 25 of them went into new AS. None of them had degrees of heart lot requiring pacing or drug treatment. And they had 10 patients who developed VT. In another group, there was 187 patients, over a quarter of which had a positive troponin. 6% of them had a VT or VF arrest as part of their um, admission. And if you have a positive troponin, perhaps unsurprisingly, because you've got more myocardial involvement, more inflammation in the heart, you are much, much more likely to have a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia. So 17% versus 1%. Um, so again, really shows you how bad a high troponin is in acute COVID. Uh, this is just a diagram showing you a few of the possible mechanisms from myocardial injury, lung inflammation, pulmonary emboli, possible interaction of some drugs and so on. Uh, but that's, those are the things you can get. The heart failure, a particular interest of mine, which we'll be hearing about a bit later on, is a very common comorbidity in patients presenting with COVID-19 to hospital. And so about 20% of those coming in the front door of, of, of the hospital have uh, heart failure with a comorbidity with COVID-19, and their mortality is much, much worse. So if you have heart failure compared to an equivalent patient without heart failure, you are about three times as likely to die of COVID-19 as an inpatient, and that's 15%. And if you look at those who died in the Chinese series, about half of them had heart failure. So not surprisingly, BNP is very closely linked to your prognosis. Having heart failure and COVID is a bad thing. Now, COVID itself can, of course, cause heart failure as well as uh, being predisposed to by it. Um, and this might be through myocarditis, systemic inflammation, ischemia, uh, PEs, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. And of course, if you've got a big septic stress response, a heart that just about hangs in there in normal circumstances suddenly has to deal with a much greater metabolic demand, and that's going to push you know, a stable heart failure patient into, into an unstable state and make them very unwell. Uh, complex diagram just showing you what we mentioned, really, just some of the, uh, the multiple mechanisms by which infection with COVID might make your heart failure worse or might give you new heart failure. Um, everything from ARDS, lung disease, sympathetic nervous system activity causing arrhythmias and tachycardia, renal impairment, septic shock, inflammatory mediators, clots, metabolic demand, and myocarditis. They're all in there as possible causes of heart failure. So we're seeing an awful lot of this. So really, when you think about the interaction between COVID-19 and the heart, you can think about the conditions that, that predispose to getting COVID-19, or at least getting severe COVID-19, requiring hospitalization or ITU. And these are things like ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and heart failure. And then, of course, once you get COVID-19, COVID-19 can then affect the heart acutely in several ways, including myocardial injury, uh, myocarditis, PEs, infarction, uh, arrhythmias, heart failure, and of course, shifts in your metabolic demand. So on both ends of the, uh, of the patient journey, unfortunately, heart disease is, is heavily implicated. This is a slightly cleverer picture showing essentially the same thing as a few of the mechanisms. I'll uh, just in the interest of time, I'll go through that a bit later. 
So what I want to talk about now is something that I'm sure is very much on your radars yeah, and I'm sure certainly will be um, more so in the coming months, probably for quite some time ahead. And that's, that's this concept of long COVID, or as we're supposed to officially call it, uh, post-acute COVID. This is COVID that are, these are patients who've had COVID and still have symptoms four to 12 weeks uh, after the initial uh, index uh, infection. And if you look at that, NICE have published some sort of quick guidelines on, on managing COVID, and they list three long COVID symptoms related to the heart. Um, and these are chest tightness, chest pain, and palpitations. But if you, if you look down the list of other potential long COVID symptoms, um, I think you'll agree that quite a few of these actually could be caused by heart disease. So breathlessness is something patients with long COVID have. Fatigue, sleep disturbance, very common in heart failure patients. Uh, dizziness, again, often cardiac. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of, psych there's a lot of post-viral fatigue, psychological, psychiatric symptoms, depression, anxiety, all of which grossly affects the way your patient feels their symptoms and is able to manage their symptoms. So a huge number of the chronic fatigue and, and other chronic symptoms you get uh, with long COVID could be explained by heart. So how common is, is long COVID? Um, well, the answer is that if you go looking for it, you will see an awful lot of it. Um, so this is the first study I mentioned there is a study from Italy um, where they contacted hospitalized patients two months after they were discharged. Um, and half of them were still feeling fatigued 43% of them were still breathless, and 22% of them were still getting chest pain symptoms. Uh, a bit closer to home, there's a, an app I'm sure many of you have on your phone, I'm sure your patients will have too, which is the, the COVID symptom study from uh, King's College London. Um, so this is not hospitalized patients, this is all patients out there with smartphones. And of those that got COVID, 13% still had symptoms four weeks later, and 4.4 and 45% still had symptoms eight weeks later. So if you think about, well, we know of six and a half million infections in the UK, and it's probably twice as many in that, if not more in real life, that's, that adds up to an awful lot of patients wandering around our, our boroughs with, uh, with symptoms of long COVID post, uh, post the infection. So in terms of who is more likely to get long COVID, um, it, it is significantly more common in women. So women about, report long COVID symptoms about twice as frequently as men. It tends to be older people, and it tends to be those that had more symptoms during their acute illness, and then maybe possible, many possible reasons. So in terms of what causes these cardiac symptoms of, of, of dizziness, breathlessness, palpitations, chest pain, one of the sort of big working theories with regards to the, the sort of dizziness and palpitations that people get is that COVID affects your autonomic nervous system. Now, uh, we've seen this before in the kind of SARS and MERS pandemics that occurred in, in years gone by, um, and there's often thought to be a viral prodrome to, to POTS. Um, so things like POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, vasovagal syncope and orth orthostatic hypotension um, are all thought to be more common in people that have had COVID. Uh, this may be because the virus itself affects the autonomic nervous system, affects your nerve endings, it affects your catecholamine release. And there's some evidence, particularly with POTS, that, that autoantibodies might be involved, and this may be part of the sort of post-viral syndrome as well. So this causes the symptoms of tachycardia, presyncope, syncope, and fatigue. In terms of what the authors recommend we do in patients who are presenting with those symptoms, it is a proper lying standing blood pressure. And so lie the patient down for five minutes, check the blood pressure and heart rate after five minutes, stand them up, and again, after three minutes, repeat the blood pressure and heart rate again. So if your systolic blood pressure falls by more than 20, or your diastolic blood pressure more than 10, or if your heart rate rises by more than 30 beats per minute on standing, uh, these are deemed abnormal physiological responses. Uh, and then these patients could be considered for tilt table testing if, uh, if, if, that's, uh, if that's what they're getting. In terms of what we do about it, um, now they also this paper recommend education, so reassuring the patient that this is not life-threatening and will probably get better, but it's horrible, um, and telling them things they can do about it. Exercise programs are thought to be useful for graduated exercise. Salt and water, a bit of extra salt on the food, keeping well hydrated, avoid exacerbating factors, dehydration, caffeine, alcohol, um, getting too hot, these things that might make postural uh, symptoms worse. Isometric exercises, like tensioning muscles and so on. Uh, head stockings to squeeze the blood out the legs and up to the head. Um, and as a last resort, there are some drugs. Now, in COVID, of course, there's no real data for any of this. So the usual postural symptoms, you can try things like fludrocortisone or midodrine to retain more fluid or to squeeze more fluid up to the brain when you stand up. Some data for clonidine and methyl dopa under specialist supervision. Um, and one area of interest is beta blockers and avabradine, actually, is for people that have a particularly getting a lot of palpitations, persistent tachycardia after COVID infection, or a POTS type syndrome where they get very tachycardic every time they stand up. Um, there is probably a role for, for beta blockers such as propranolol, bisoprolol, or avabradine, a, 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 a um, cyanoatrial mode slowing drug um, to slow the heart down 
sort of take the edge off the, the excessive uh, sympathetic nervous system responses people get and make their symptoms better. But the evidence base for that is, is still pretty, pretty thin, unfortunately. Two minutes, please, Simon. Perfect, I'm almost done. Uh, in terms of the chest pain, now lots of possible theories as to why patients with COVID get chest pain. Now, some of it may, of course, be related to ongoing inflammation in the lung. Uh, and of course, lots of patients have had peas, pulmonary emboli as well, which might be giving some chest pain. Uh, there is certainly a, a chain of thought or a, a sort of uh, thought process that, that leads to microvascular thrombi being implicated. So because patients with COVID get lots of clots everywhere as part of their thrombotic response, it, it is thought that they might get micro, uh, microvascular clots in the heart, which might give them ischemia and chest pain off the back of that. But another interesting, this is an interesting study actually from Germany where they looked at 100 patients uh, 70 days after they were diagnosed with COVID, a third of whom were hospitalized. And they did MRI scans on 100 patients, cardiac MRI scans. Uh, and 5% of these patients, they compared them with age and comorbidity match controls. Uh, and 5% of these patients still had significantly elevated troponin levels 70 days after their index admission with or index diagnosis of, uh, of long COVID. And if you looked at the MRI, and that's the, the image you can see on the right here. So those that were treated at home actually had lower troponin 70 days down the line than those that were hospitalized. So perhaps the worse your COVID is, the more likely you are to have ongoing troponin leak, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, and if you look at the actual MRI scanning itself, uh, there is significantly more T1 and T2 imaging. Now, I'm not an MRI specialist, but uh, that's a, an indication there's more inflammation and edema in the heart um, in those that had COVID versus those that didn't. And there's more late gadolinium, gadolinium enhancement as well, which is a sign of scar tissue and fibrosis in the heart. So a lot of these patients had that. Their ejection fractions are slightly worse, their LV volumes are slightly bigger. And actually, if you looked at all indices of cardiac damage, 78% of those who'd had COVID had some degree of cardiac involvement uh, with the index uh, or chronic viral infection. Um, so it is incredibly common if you look at it, uh, look for it carefully. And of those that they like myocardial biopsy in Germany, so the patients that had myocardial biopsy, nearly all of them had a lymphocytosis in the heart, suggesting ongoing inflammation, perhaps ongoing viral infection, perhaps an autoimmune process going in the heart that was giving them this ongoing troponin leak. Now, what we do about that is, is a whole other question that we don't know the answer to, but it's interesting that there's that much cardiac involvement if you look carefully for it. Drugs, I'll skip over this in the interest of time. There was a lot of interest in the early days about ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and whether they should be stopped in people with COVID uh, because of COVID binding to the ACE2 inhibitor, the ACE2 receptor. In animals, there's no doubt that ACE does upregulate ACE2, but in humans, the picture is much more complex than that. And it's not clear whether ACE inhibitors actually give you more ACE2 expression and therefore bigger chance. And there's no evidence at all that ACE inhibitors and ARBs increase your risk of getting COVID-19 or having a worse outcome. So if the patient's on the drugs for a good reason, uh, please do not stop that drug unless we absolutely have to. Remdesivir seems to be fine with the heart. Dexamethasone might be an issue or steroids generally for patients with heart failure in terms of fluid retention. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, in this, this time we're in now, vaccination seems to be good for heart patients and does not seem to have any significant uh, risks for heart patients. So uh, and, and since we know that heart patients do very badly with COVID, um, it is essential that these people get vaccinated. So just to wrap things up, hopefully about on time, uh, cardiac involvement in acute and long COVID is extremely common if you're looking for it. Um, please be alert to the possibility of cardiac complications. Think about examining the heart, think about checking the BMP, think about checking the troponin. Um, please continue the ACEs and the ARBs if at all possible. And, and please do encourage your patients with heart disease to have the vaccine because we, these people are the people who do not want to be catching COVID because they will have the worst outcomes. Thank you very much. And I hope you've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Simon. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, yes, we've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone's got one. Clearly, that was extremely comprehensive and you've answered everybody's questions. Stop the morning of silence. <laughs> Nothing, nothing at all. Okay, pretty good. Actually, I think we've just. Well, feel free to type a question on the uh, on the meeting chat if that's easy. Uh, yes, yes, we have got some questions now. Um, so, when would you refer to um, KGH or um, W WMH long COVID clinics? That's a good question, actually. In, in terms of what's happening with long COVID clinics. So we, we don't have a sort of formal long COVID clinic at the moment. Um, I 
uh, I'm seeing some patients in my clinic and the respiratory physicians are picking up some of the patients as well in, in there. I know Farid Bazari has got, uh, got an interest in the respiratory side of long COVID. So I think, I think the answer is patients with intractable symptoms who aren't getting better. Um, so if you've got patients who are still breathless four weeks plus post, um, post, uh, post COVID, have a listen to the chest, are there any findings of the chest? Feel free to get a chest x-ray. Are there any ongoing changes on the chest x-ray? Either of those things would be worth sending up to uh, the respiratory clinic. If the patient's got low saturation, so if they desaturate by more than 3% on exertion or if their resting fats are below 96% in a, in a non-smoker or somebody without chronic lung disease, um, those patients should be referred up to the lung clinic for follow-up. Um, if there's any concern about long COVID affecting the heart, such as an elevated BMP, an elevated troponin level, an abnormal ECG, chest pains that aren't settling down and sound in any way cardiac, um, then they should definitely be referred up to the cardiology clinic. So th those are the patients I'd screen out. But I, I would, given there's an awful lot of patients out there with these symptoms, I think we'd probably appreciate a troponin test, a BMP test, or at least an oxygen saturation um, as a kind of screening test first. And if they're abnormal, absolutely send these patients up to our clinics. Thank you very much. And I think, again, in the interest of time, I will say thank you, Simon, and hand over to Rajay. Thanks, Simon. Great talk. Uh, can you see me? We can. Excellent. So I'll just try and share my screen. Can you see my screen? We can, yes. So my name is Dr. Rajin Narayana. I'm a consultant cardiologist, a heart failure specialist at St. George's Hospital. And obviously, as my topic says that I'm going to talk about new evidence and innovation in the field of heart failure. As you know that we have got a big number of patients, especially in Southwest London with heart failure. And during the COVID times, we have been managing these patients through our specialist nurses, mainly in the community who have done an excellent work because you know, these patients are quite high-risk patients and we don't want these patients to come to the hospital. And hence, we have been doing lots of supervision meetings like this, where we discuss the patients, their, their bloods, their weight, their heart function, and make some plans so that they can be managed best in the community. But uh, heart failure is emerging as a very big global health challenge, especially in times of COVID. And that is what I'm going to talk about and see what and how we can manage these complicated patients uh, in the current scenario. So before I do that, I always like talking about this slide. This is the global burden disease data. So this is something that I'm sure many of you may have seen, but for those who are not aware, this is from Salim Yusuf from the famous global burden disease data that tells you what are the problems which are causing death at the moment. And if you look at the top 10, 20 question problems, ischemic heart disease and stroke are top two. And this is the case in the UK as well. But going 20 years ahead in time, in 2040, ischemic heart disease and stroke will still be the top two killers nationally and globally. But look at number 15 here in 2016-17. Diabetes is number 15, but diabetes will climb and become number seven. Chronic kidney disease is number 16. It will climb and become number five. So what does this slide tell us? It tells us that diabetes and chronic kidney disease are again emerging problems. And we all know that people with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, again, they have heart problems, ischemic heart disease, and heart failure. So again, it's a mixture of things that a lot of our patients have. Some of them have diabetes, some of them have chronic kidney disease. So this is something that, again, we need to focus and try and do more in managing these high-risk patients. And why should we do this? And the reason we should be doing this is because there's a new pulse survey published by the WHO because of the COVID scenario. So what it says that in non-communicable diseases, the diagnosis and treatment in 193 countries, including UK, will be affected by up to 70%. So 70% of the patients with blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, heart problems, all these non-communicable diseases are going to get affected and miss their targets by up to 70% because of COVID. And this is very, very challenging. And hence, it is very important that we try and manage all these high-risk patients with heart failure, with diabetes, with chronic kidney disease, as well as possible with the best evidence that is out there so that we can give them the best long-term outcome. So heart failure is a global health issue. We all know that. 
till recently we knew that the incidence is somewhere between 26 to 30 million but at the last european society cardiology meeting we came to know that the numbers are just double than what we knew the numbers of number of patients with heart failure globally stands at 60 million and not 26 to 30 million that we thought of till recently so the numbers are rising almost one in five people globally are likely to develop heart failure in their lifetime so this is the number that we are dealing with there is 17.4 percent chance of mortality at one year in these patients again 50 percent of these patients are likely to die because of heart failure at five years of their diagnosis and up to 40 50 percent of these patients they keep coming back to our hospital as we know with readmissions and heart failure if you look at the comparison uh, that we have put on this slide to comparing with prostate cancer lung cancer you can see heart failure is just below lung cancer and colorectal cancer for male and for females as well so again it's an emerging global health challenge just like any cancer that we know of this is a slide that we that is talking about diabetes but i'll tell you in a minute why we have just suddenly jumped to diabetes so the current number of diabetic patients around the world are about 400 to 450 million but in 20 years time this is again going to jump as we saw in the global burden disease slide to up to 630 million so again number of diabetes globally in any part of the world that you go to is going to jump massively we know that ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes so again almost 40 50 percent patients with diabetes are likely to get ischemic heart disease they also get stroke they also get uh, kidney problems but look at this 15 percent at the right bottom other heart diseases so what are these other heart diseases that present in patients with diabetes so we have already mentioned ischemic heart disease but there's something emerging now 15 percent in diabetic patients so we all know that people with uh, diabetes are likely to get angina stroke heart attack tia kidney problems but look at this heart failure so that 15 percent that we're talking about was heart failure so people with diabetes are likely to develop heart failure so what is this heart failure and how does it affect how do people with diabetes get heart failure so this is what exactly happens you don't need to have a blocked artery to have a drop in your rejection fraction so as i said that people with diabetes are likely to get blockage in their arteries but many people that i see in my clinic have crystal clear arteries but they still have heart failure and these are the people who developed heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so what exactly happens in diabetic patients so they have hyperglycemia insulin resistance obesity and all these changes they lead to further changes in the body like inflammatory cytokine release increased oxidative stress mitochondrial dysfunction increased usage of free fatty acid and all these chemical changes that we are talking about they lead to cardiac fibrosis and left ventricular hypertrophy so left ventricular hypertrophy and cardiac fibrosis is the ultimate change that happens because of diabetes in heart failure patients and these are the patients if you do the echo scan you will see that the pumping of the heart ejection fraction is 55 60 percent but they have all got high bnp and they've all got signs of heart failure so whenever you get high bnp in a diabetic who's presented with shortness of breath they may have a plum normal echo like systolic function being completely normal so look at their diastolic dysfunction because that is what happens in diabetic patients and this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction diabetes as we know has got considerable impact on patients quality of life because again it causes a lot of problem with their pain mental health vitality general health so again these are all problems and complications that we are aware of we also know that diabetes also leads to renal end stage disease because like diabetes is the leading cause of end stage renal disease they also present with a lot of micro and macrovascular complications as we are aware of as we can see on this slide eye problems peripheral vascular problems amputation and obviously kidney diseases this is how diabetes affects the kidney there's inflammation, there is renin angiotensin system activation, oxidative stress, and all this leads to further changes in the kidney itself. So it leads to afferent arterial occlusion, thickening of the arterial wall, mesangial cell hypertrophy, basement membrane thickening. So all these changes that leads to glomerular hypertension, hyperfiltration, and drop in your EGFR. So that is how your kidney gets affected in diabetic patients. But the interesting thing to know is that almost 70% of the NHS money is used 
in managing complications from diabetes. So hardly any money is used for medications and insulin in NHS. Almost 70-80% of the money is spent in managing all these kidney problems, heart problems that we are talking about. Why was I talking about diabetes? I was talking about diabetes now because if you develop heart failure and if you had diabetes from before, there is high five-year absolute relative risk of death and decrease in your lifespan. So again, if a diabetic patient develops heart failure, their, their chance of developing, can you still see my slides? Yes. Can you, can you see my slides? Yeah. So again, people who've got diabetes, if they develop heart failure, <clears throat> their five-year chance of absolute risk of death and decrease in the lifespan is quite high. And that is why we were talking about diabetes. So this is all heart failure with preserved ejection fraction mainly. So looking at some current strategies, we know that this is on the right that we know of, and that is what we have been dealing with. People with decrease in the rejection fraction, whether it be 20, 30, 40%, we know that the pumping of the heart becomes weak. There is stretching of the heart muscle walls and dilated chambers, and the heart is not able to pump properly. So again, the pumping is reduced. But look on the left. This is what I'm talking about. This is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So what happens here? There's stiffening and thickening of the heart chambers. So they become stiff and small. So the amount of blood that you can have during diastole to throw out again in the next systole goes down. Your filling and relaxation gets affected. So this is diastolic heart failure that we have been talking about. And this is something that we are learning more and more now because this is something that we need to be aware of because you can't, die, you can't discharge a patient just looking at the rejection fraction. Always, always look at their diastolic dysfunction because especially in diabetics, hypertensives, so those are the three groups, four groups that you need to be aware of. Ischemic heart disease patients, hypertension patients, diabetes patients, and patients with sleep apnea are likely to present with diastolic heart failure. And these are some of the treatment that we have learned about whether it be enalepril, whether it be carbidolol, valsartan, uh, device therapy, evabridine, epiletanone, MRA. So again, these are all emerging therapies that have come to our knowledge in the last few decades. And this is what we normally use as we all have been using ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRA like spironolactone, ep ep epiletanone, ARB. So again, these are some important studies which leads to reduction in their long-term mortality, as you can see in this slide. So again, this is something standard treatment that we have been doing for our patients. But when it comes to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the ones with diabetes and hypertension and ischemic heart disease, you have to be more specific. You have to try and look at more specific causes like blood pressure. So if the blood pressure is the reason, you have to control the blood pressure with these drugs. If diabetes is the problem, again, you have to control with these drugs. If pulmonary hypertension is the problem, which is the right side, then obviously there are other group of drugs. So again, depending on what the, uh, the etiology for the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is, you should try and use these particular drugs in these particular uh, problems and pathologies. This is something we all know of, and we all have learned a lot in the last few years, and this is the most talked about thing in the world of cardiology at the moment, SGLT2 drugs and heart failure. I can tell you the European Society cardiology meeting last year had 88,000 cardiologists from across the world. And out of the four days, two and a half days, they were just talking about SGLT2 and heart failure. So that is how important this drug is now. And the European Society cardiology guideline says that if you have got a patient who is high risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular patient, you should always, always consider adding on an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 drug if they're already on metformin irrespective of their HbA1c. So no matter what their HbA1c, get your SGLT2 as soon as possible. And this is again the American Diabetes Association. This is the European Society of Diabetes. And all of them, they say, consider GLP-1 and SGLT2 drugs early in these high-risk patients. Rasha, you've got two minutes. Yeah. So again, this is how your SGLT2 works. This is a SGLT2 receptor in the kidneys. And as you can see, that if you have an SGLT2 receptor, if you block this receptor, what happens is that this part of the kidney has got a proximity and has got a tendency to absorb glucose. But if you block it with an SGLT2, 